Please turn your hymn books to 406. We're going to sing all four verses. My hope is in the Lord. There is no more sure hope than that. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. No merit of my own is anger to suppress, my only hope is found in Jesus' righteousness. For me he died, for me he lives, an everlasting life and light he freely gives. And now for me he stands before the Father's throne. He shows his wounded hands and names me at his own. For me he died, for me he lives, an everlasting life and light he freely gives. His grace has planned it all, tis mine but to believe, and recognize his work of love and Christ receive. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he Please remain standing for prayer. All right, let's pray tonight. Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for this evening. And indeed, Lord, our, our hope truly is in you tonight. Lord, of all the things going around us, we, we know that you're our hope, you're our rock, you're our strength, you're our fortress. And Lord, underneath the cleft of your wings is where we'll hide. Well, thank you and praise you. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Guys, you can put that up if not using it tonight. So they do a song and huh? a song and an offering? Yeah, song and an offering will be done, yeah. All right, please, while you're up, please take your hymn books. 332. 332. I hope you enjoy singing as much as I do. Now, it's one thing I had to learn because I did not marry a morning person. Hmm. I love to sing out when I first get up. Oh my goodness, it took me years to be quiet. Hmm. Tone it down. But, nonetheless, I just sing softly. <laughs> it's hard to sing softly. Hmm. But I do. It's 332. 332, without him. I've never heard this one before. Hmm. I, I'll learn it with you. Hmm. Hmm. Here we go. Without him I could do nothing, without him I surely fail, without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost I would be. What a pretty song.
Oh my goodness, what a pretty song. Can we do that first one one more time and then do the second verse? How about that? All right. Him I could do nothing without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship with to say, sing it, Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him. How lost I would be Without Him I would be dying Without Him I'd be enslaved Without Him I would be hopeless But with Jesus and God Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost I would. Pretty song, very good for the first time. It's the first time for me, anyway. All right, so Mr. Joshua, would you ask of God's blessing on the offering? Dear Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you'll bless this message that we hear tonight, and I pray that you'll bless the offering. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. been practicing. Good to hear. All right, I should be on back there. There we go. All right. Message tonight, and I, I, I don't have a PowerPoint for you, but you'll have to take notes. Right? Do that, take some notes, and you'll get this, and you'll earn this, and it will be good. So I'm uh, uh, bringing a message tonight on the rapture. All right? And uh, just maybe clear up a few things, give you some things in Scripture that you can use to help you as you uh, uh, study through this, uh, this great doctrine that we teach. And uh, how many times is the word rapture used in the Bible? Zero, Zero right? Uh, it seems to means to be caught up or to caught away. And we'll see that if you open your Bibles to the Re book of Revelation, John chapter 4, or Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4 tonight. Let's go ahead and start in verse 1. We saw before the things that, that are. And now we're going to look at the things that will be as we get into this now. After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hence after or hereafter. 
And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he sat, and then he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Father, we come before you tonight. We pray that you'll help us as we study through this great doctrine. Uh, the next great thing on your agenda is the calling away of your saints, the beginning of that seven-year tribulation time. Help us to look at the scriptures tonight. Lord, help us to realize that uh, uh, it doesn't mean we need to sit back and do nothing. Lord, we need to understand the, the urgency then to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For in his name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. All right, we've got some basic notes here I'll work off today. Unfortunately, they're in about a 10 font. So if I bend down a lot, you'll know why. Now, let me tell you, first of all, the doctrine of the rapture. Uh, the Bible tells us this, that no man knows when Jesus is coming. In fact, the Bible even says that Jesus doesn't even know when the Father will send him. So I've heard people say, well, if you believe in the uh, pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib or whatever, uh, and I don't believe in that, then you're going to hell because we don't believe it right. Uh, I believe there's some strong, strong doctrine for a mid-trib rapture or a post-pre-trib rapture. Let me get this right. A pre-trib rapture of the church, okay? Pre-trib, P R E. Okay, rapture, and I'll explain that to you uh, as we go through this. But understand, some folks, they, they don't believe that way. And I'll tell you to this, the only thing to send somebody to hell is not believing in Jesus. Right? right? So we need to understand that tonight. I once heard a man say, and I'll slow down a little bit here, it's been a busy week. Amen? Yeah. And uh, heard some one man say, look at You've got your thoughts, I've got my thoughts, and we get to heaven, we'll find out what the truth is. And that's true on some of these things, okay? Um, there are, as a group that believes, uh, we are pre-millennialist. We believe that the rapture of the church will come, pre-tribulationist, pre-millennialist, we believe that the rapture of the church will come before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And I'll give you scriptures for that. That's my belief. That's what I believe the scriptures teach. We'll look at that tonight. There's some that believe in a mid-trib rapture. And I'll give you some reasons tonight why I don't believe in that. Uh, they believe that you know, simply uh, halfway through, uh, three and a half years, uh, 1260 days into the uh, tribulation time, will come the rapture. The church will be saved from what is called, they differentiate between the tribulation and and the Great Tribulation. I will tell you this today. There is an intensifying in the second half. But you don't want to be here for the first half either. Okay? It's all Great Tribulation. There's another group that believe that in a post-millennial view. Post-tribulation, post-millennial view. That Christ will rapture us up just before he brings out his final vengeance upon this earth, the battle of Armageddon, and, and, and that is done, he'll take us out. There's also something called an amillennial view, uh, that there is no thousand-year reign of Christ, that uh, the, the tribulation comes and things just keep on going, and we just keep on living that way. I, I think that one is not very well accepted. The two main ones are mid-trib and pre-trib. So let's take a look tonight it's some scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about that. First of all, we have to differentiate between the first coming and the second coming. Amen. And that's hard for folks to do because we, we say Christ is coming again, but his coming is in two parts. And we'll understand that, I think, more as we go, we go through this tonight. And so look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. You're going to use your Bible tonight. So get it out, get it ready, and use it. Amen? Amen? The only way you're going to be, and these are things, listen, as you're talking to folks, uh, you can help them to understand some of these things. So first of all, Christ comes in the air. He comes in the clouds. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, 
and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Bible simply tells us this, that he will come in the clouds. Remember in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended up into heaven, and the angel said, he will come in like manner as you see him go. So we understand this, Jesus will come in the clouds. Right? We got that part? Because you're going to look at the difference between this and the second coming as we go through it. So I'll give you about five parts here. You're in verse 16 and 17, the same chapter. And we see in verse 16 that the trump will sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those are people who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior before they died. We, we got that? Some of this is pretty simple, but we'll just put it in order for you. Those who put their faith and trust in Christ and they died before Christ would come. And by the way, I, I believe in an imminent return of Christ. But understand, they've been looking for Christ for 2,000 years, right. right? So the odds, if you want to do odds, are, are pretty good that we will see death unless Christ comes. Look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them, where? In the clouds. To meet the Lord, where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we understand he comes in the clouds and he comes for his saints. Who are saints? All those that put their faith and trust in Christ. All Christians are saints. Now sometimes we may act like ain'ts, but we're saints, right? And uh, we don't need to be canonized or anything like that. Uh, Christ took care of that when we got saved. So we are his saints. So we understand that. So he's coming for his saints. Does he come for the lost? No. He's coming for his saints. Now his timing when he comes, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. And then we'll go back to 1 Thessalonians again, so don't take your hand out of there, even though most of you already did. There we go. I'm sorry. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, We shall not all sleep. Sleep is a way in which God speaks of the, the Christian death. There is no soul sleep, but the body, this body will be in the grave until the rapture. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the dead shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on uh, incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortal. So then, and, you know, death words I sing, and it goes on to speak of this. It is a mystery. A mystery is something that has not been revealed by God. A mystery isn't something like Halloween, and you go and you stick your hand in a mystery box and see what's in there. It's simply something that hasn't been revealed by the Lord. And as time goes, understand, we're studying stuff today that the first church didn't have high nor hair or thought about some of this, right? Because the book of Revelation hadn't been written yet. They did know Christ was coming back. Why? Because in Acts chapter 1, he said he was, right? Okay, so they knew he was coming back. So we see this, that it is a mystery. It's, he's coming in the air. He's coming for his saints. It's a mystery. And we know this today, and you can go back to 1 Thessalonians again, uh, chapter 4, and verse 13. It says, but I would not have you to be ignorant. That's just unknowing. To be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Look at chapter 5 and verse 2. Same text. 5 verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Go we'll back up to verse 1. It says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Why? Because he's coming as a thief in the night. We understand this today, that only Christians are going to see him. He comes as a thief. When a thief comes to your house to steal things, well, they used to anyway, in the text here, they would come at night. 
right? Now they don't care. They'll come in broad daylight. They don't care if you're home or not. If they, that's why I tell folks, lock your doors during the day. A lot of thieves, they don't care. They'll come in. You know, son, if you're standing there, they'll shoot you. They'll knock you down. They don't care. It doesn't matter to them. We have reached a point where we are just beyond immoral in our country. Even the thieves have no, no, no morality, I guess you could say. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Understand something. He will take out his children. And I'll get more into this as we go down through this. He'll take out his children before he pours out his wrath upon this earth. We will be removed. But I'll show you something that will happen to those who have heard the gospel. And this is why, listen, this is why it's eminent. Some people that are mid-tribs believe that our, we fail to warn people. But I, I will say this. There's a greater warning behind an eminent mystery. Who knows when it's going to happen? Rapture. The one that I know is going to happen 1,260 days after the tribulation begins. Right. Got that? That's the midway point of the tribulation. We must tell the lost at any cost. Now, so let's look at the return of Christ. I want you to look at Matthew 24, 29, and 30. If you want to cheat, keep your hand in 1 Thessalonians. Eventually, we're going to come back there. Matthew chapter 24, 29, and 30. Okay. Immediately after the tribulation, those days uh, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, uh, clouds of heaven with power and great glory, right? Now turn back to the book of, 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 of Zechariah in chapter 14 and verse 4. See, it's important to know your Old Testament so you understand the New Testament. Speaking about the day of the Lord, the, the day of judgment, the day of his coming. In Zechariah 14, 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, break in two, and there shall be a great valley, and a half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. So what do we see? In the rapture, he came where? In the clouds. In the second coming, he comes where? To the Mount of Olives. He touches his feet down. They are two separate occurrences. Look over at Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Don't you love using your Bible like this? Yeah. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. When he had spoken these words, these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked, verse 10, Acts chapter 1, they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus is taken up from you into heaven, and sh shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So we understand this today as we read this text of Scripture. Uh, they returned unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem, the Sabbath day's journey. They saw him go up in the clouds, come back in the clouds. In the second coming, by the way, will just saints see him? Who's going to see him? Everyone's going to see him. You know, we have now with, and if we go back in time, people may have wondered, in fact, in, in my day, and when I was first saved, how will everyone see him? I grew up pre-CNN, pre-Fox, 
free FaceTime, free internet, pre, you name it, pre-dinosaurs, okay? Prehistoric, right? I was paleoith, paleolithic or whatever those things are, okay? Long time ago. And the question was, well, how could the news media get around the world? How could they have cameras? How could they have that? Do you, do you understand how many times in the course of a day that you are on videotape? Do you ever watch the news and someone, they, they break it in or they do this, and they got all kinds of videotape, right? These people who break in and steal, they, they are stupid because there's cameras everywhere watching what they do. By the way, they're watching what you do everywhere you go, right? And now we have CNN, we have the Internet, we have cameras, we have Fox, we have all these things. It won't be difficult for all eyes to be in Jerusalem. That's where they're going to be anyway during that, that time, right? Everything is focused on a little piece of land the size of New Jersey. The whole world, think about it. The whole world will focus on that one place. The wars, everything is going to be fought, everything right there in that spot. Every camera, every, everything, every news group will be there, and they will see Jesus. But when Jesus comes in the clouds, for us at the rapture, we're the only ones that are going to see him. And by the way, we'll be up in heaven. Right? We'll see that a little bit too when we get further into this. Jude 14, go to the book of Revelation and go forward one book, uh, chapter 1. Now here's what we're going to do, folks. And again, I've heard people preach against this, but you can't preach against the book. Okay? Again, speaking of the Lord coming back. He says, well, he just comes back by himself. That's not what my book says. It says, and Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands. There's a plural on there. Of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly and among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The Lord's going to come back and execute judgment. And when he comes back, guess what? We're coming with him. Amen. We get, if you don't ride a horse very well, start warning because you're going to ride one that day. You'll be coming back with the Lord. But here's, here's the difference, folks. We're coming back, but it's the Lord that's going to execute judgment. You're not going to come back with your AKRA or whatever, 15 or 17 or whatever. and You're not going to come back and, and do all those things. You're coming back with him, but you're going to watch as, as judgment is executed upon this land. And the Lord will take it. He'll, he'll lay his sickle low. The Bible says and on that day, the blood will flow. We've, we've seen the valley of Megiddo. We've overlooked it as we, as we were there in Megiddo and looking at the, 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 the area across there. And you could see almost uh, north uh, up to where uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee would be and, and then down to the south, almost to the Dead Sea and then over to the, uh, uh, the east. The Bible says that land will be filled with blood up to the horse's bridles. Think about that. What a day of bloodshed. We, we kind of talk sometimes. Hey, have you noticed all the birds are coming back? My wife says, well, maybe God's preparing them for a great feast. Yeah. Right? A great feast. So we understand this. He'll come with his saints. But in the rapture, he comes what? For his saints. Rapture for his saints, second coming, he comes with his saints. Um, Zechariah 14, you can go back and read through that. There it's not a mystery. He's told them, look, at, the Lord is coming back and he is going to execute judgment. The book of Daniel, we, you know, we can, the, to really understand a lot of this, we'll get into this more. You need to understand the book of Daniel, Daniel's 70th week. 
And uh, we understand that 70th week is that week what we call the tribulation time. God really laid it out for the folks. He, he told all of us to go back and do the study. Uh, and, and we can go through and we can see when Christ was going to be put to death. Almost to the year when you go back and do the, the math on those, those years that David pro, or Daniel prophesied. And then we have what's now the church age. It's a time when, when God has set aside Israel for a time and he is working through this dispensation through the church age. At the end of the church age comes the rapture. And once again, God will work on Israel. He's in Jerusalem. He's working on them over there. So we understand that if you, you, you take a look at some of those, Isaiah 11, Psalm 72. Let me give you a couple more as we go through this, okay? Had he, we, we know this, that 1,260 days into the tribulation time, the Antichrist is going to enter into the temple and desecrate the Holy of Holies. That's what he's going to do. Uh, the beast, I know the word Antichrist doesn't even appear in the book of Revelation. We use that as the, the one who's coming, who set himself up as Christ. And so we, we, we study through this. That's a later study as well as we go through that. But understand this, and, and part of my question for people who believe in mid-trib is when do you know when the, the tribulation starts? Right. We know this, the rapture, as John speaks in, John, in, in, in Revelation chapter 4, that is the last time the church is mentioned in the Bible. That's it. In heaven, we're not called the church. We're his saints. Get that? So that's the last time the church is mentioned, and then he begins to deal here on this earth with lost people, executing judgment upon the world. Look at Matthew uh, uh, 24, verse 36. Matthew 24 and verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, the, the return of Christ. We don't know what's going to happen. But if it's 1,260 days, then we know when it's going to happen. If a, you know, if a, a large sign falls down from heaven, you know, tribulation begins. Um, I don't know how they're going to do that, but however that is, you know, we can count there for 1,260 days. And if you know that, you've got three and a half years. Look at, you can wait three and a quarter years. Just make sure your math isn't off and wait and get saved then if you want to. But it's not going to happen that way. And we'll see that again as we continue to go through this. Christ will be visible to all. We saw that uh, here you are in Matthew chapter 24 and, and, and verse 27. Whereas the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even out of the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They're, they're all going to see him. But in the, tri the rapture, only saints will see him. A difference between the second coming and the rapture. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, head on back over there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And look at verses 8 through 12. And then shall that wicked be revealed. He won't be revealed to the midpoint of the tribulation. Right? Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying and wonders and with all deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Let me stop there for a second. In 2 Peter 3.9, the Bible tells us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men might count slackness. But as us toward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I've heard people say, what, a, what an awful God. That would put people through what we read about in the book of, in the book of Revelation. 
Well, the answer is simply this. They choose to do it. They choose to go through it. They reject the truth. They reject salvation. Some, you've given people tracts. You've given people those cards. You've spoken to them. Countless thousands, millions of Christians over the years have done the same thing. But if people simply reject it, then what they're doing is basically saying, I'll, I'll send myself through all this. If they don't die and go to hell first, they'll go through the tribulation time. Now, now watch, I've, I've heard this. How many have read the books left behind or seen the movies, right? Good things to put in the local garbage can because they're void of scriptural truth. Look good, not good. Keep going. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks. Um, let's go back up. They may be, verse 12, they might be damned. Oh, verse 11, that's where I was. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe what? A lie. A lie. You get one chance at this, folks. You get one shot in this lifetime to put your faith and trust in Christ. Now, I'm not saying you get once to do it, but this is the lifetime that you have. When the rapture comes, when the church is called out, there's no more opportunity. He ties it right in here with his, his judgment. When that rapture happens, it's not that you will want to be saved if you're unsaved, but he will send delusion that you can't help but believe the lie of the devil, of the beast, of, of that one wicked one that's in charge. You can't help but believe it. You won't have any ability to believe it. And by the way, at this point, we also know that the Holy Spirit has been removed. Right? And we'll get to that as well. So we, we look at this today, a strong difference. Now, here's, here's where I've been kind of, some people say, well, again, I'll go back to where I was, I was at before. Well, then, the people, what, what happens if you are wrong? So, well, could happen, I guess, right? I mean, by, but we think we've got it right, right? But we also understand this, that there, there's a time coming. There'll be great tribulation. There's tribulation right now. Anybody noticed? People being put to death. Churches being closed all over the world. Christians being slaughtered. It happened in the dark ages. It's happened throughout time. You can go back all the way throughout time. Christians have been persecuted. There's tribulation that we've, we've suffered all throughout that time. But nothing like will happen during the great tribulation. I believe the Bible's true. I believe we are interpreting it correctly. But I think the greater cause, the greater cause is this, and I, I said it earlier. You need to go talk to your friends about the Lord. You need to start inviting them to church. We need to get out of the, the Calvinistic viewpoint that, you know, God pointed certain people to go to hell and certain people to go to heaven. That's not even biblical. My Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Does yours say that? Mine says that. Okay. So we need to stop sitting on our duffs and waiting for people to come into church or, or just sitting around waiting for the rapture or sitting around, oh, praise God, I'm going to heaven. Don't care anybody else is, but I'm going. We've got to lose the attitude, folks, and realize that you have loved ones. Now think about this. I've not thought about it until just now. The rapture happens today. We are in heaven. We come back. But you have loved ones that are unsaved. And somehow, some way, they make it all the way through the seven years. You're coming from heaven. You're going to watch your relatives and your friends get slaughtered at Armageddon? Think about what's going to happen. We need to tell, folks. It's our duty to tell. It's our obligation. It is our privilege to tell. It is their responsibility to believe. To understand, to hear, take the convicting of the Holy Spirit and put their faith and trust in Christ. I have never saved a soul in my life. I'm not God. I can't save souls. I can't forgive sins. Right? God can. But we need to bring them, as, as Andrew brought Peter, uh, to, we need to bring them to Jesus. That's what we need to do. 
It's a shame today when, when, when many of our Christian churches are a half or a quarter the size that they once were. There, there, there's more people out there, folks. There's more people to reach. But are we reaching them? Are we going to them? Christ will bring judgment. Now, let me take a second point here that some people have said, well, that's a new theory brought up in the mid-1800s. I want to put a little squash on that if I could, okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. The imminent return of Jesus Christ has been with us since that very point when he went up into heaven. Now, when Jesus ascended into heaven, what was the time frame that was given for his return? A year? A week? 5,000 years? There was none. There was no time frame. This is kind of like... Uh, Maybe uh, our, our teenagers here, maybe back when I was a teenager, and our parents going away and saying, we'll be back shortly. Get your jobs done. Right. What does shortly mean? Half an hour? An hour? Can I goof around for half the day and wait for them to come back? I don't know. Best thing to do is what? Get the jobs done now, right? And play after in case their shortly means longer than what it was. But Paul, in, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 4, and verse 18, he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, he speaks about the, the coming. So let's go back and read verse 13 again and, and come back. Well, we read those. Let's not take the time. You read it. But he says, we're going to comfort one another with these words. Look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Go to the end of your T-books. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus 2 and verse 13. Okay. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that sound like they're looking for Christ to come? Was the book of Titus written in 1830? The closest I can come to it is in my Bible. It's on page 1820. Okay? Titus was looking for it. Right? Paul was looking for it. Those apostles that stood there watching, looking up, were looking for it. There's a reason the church met every day. Because they wanted to be ready. You know, the bridegroom cometh, right? Right? They wanted to be ready. By the way, I think we ought to live our lives like Christ is coming back in the next 30 minutes. But then we ought to witness for the Lord the same way. Right? We ought to realize he could come back and what will he find us dressed in? Will our robes be white? Will they be stained with sin? My wife often says, I don't want to go there because if the Lord comes back, he won't find me. <laughs> Think about some places we go, right? Some things, he could break up a good gossip conversation, right? Wait a minute, Lord, I'm not done yet. Talking about Boyd, okay? You know, wait a minute, I'm not done yet. But, but here's my problem. He's the blessed hope. He's coming back. But how comforting would it be? I just jotted down a, a few thoughts about the tribulation. And how comforting would it be if we know we get to go through death and destruction, famine and pestilence, drought, economic and political and spiritual upheaval such as this world has never seen. We will see one third of the world's population die. Later, another 25% of the world's population will die. Now, I don't know about you, and I, when I read the book of Revelation, I read the first part, I, I start thinking, that's not really comfort. Right. Here's what's going to happen. All these things are going to happen, but comfort one another because the Lord's coming back. You know, when, when God sent the flood to destroy this world, 
He took all those who trusted in him out first. Didn't he? He took out Enoch. Or Enoch, yeah, there I go, mixing my stories. He took out Noah, right? By the I mentioned Enoch because Enoch is a, it, it's a picture of the church. He was, and then he was not. That's the picture of the rapture. He was taken up. He gives us that picture way back in the Old Testament that he's going to come back, and here we are, and then we're going to be gone. No time frame put, no 1,260 days, no 2,520 days. At any time, it is imminent. He'll appear in the air. He'll come for his saints, right? You know, take us up with him. When I look at this, and there's a time when we, we, we see the flood, we see the ark, a picture of Christ. By the way, who closed the door on the ark? God did. I see some of these storytellers that says Noah closing the ark or, or whatever. God closed the door. When God says the last person that's going to repent has turned to me, that's it. And that'll be it. By the way, can souls be saved during the tribulation time? The answer to that is yes. There'll be people that are born, people that will come of age. Some people maybe never heard the gospel. They'll hear it during that time because during that time, God will work again with Israel and there'll be, and we'll get to this when we get through our study, just giving you an overview, 144,000 Jewish missionaries. That's more missionaries that are on the field right now and a third of the population is going to be gone. Right? Everybody will hear. When we think of that, that, the, that the text of Scripture where it speaks about that the, the Lord won't come until the gospel is preached everywhere. It's really referring to that time during the tribulation, not the rapture time. Although anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to wonder with our, our, our media and stuff like that. I ran into a, a lady at our, uh, my reunion says, I'm really enjoying watching your, your, uh, your sermons. Uh, and, and she was 400 miles away. Okay, didn't know I had a classmate watching, but it was good to hear, and uh, that's what she was doing. Let me give you another, by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah. Did God remove the Christians from there first? Yeah, he did. He removed them out. Uh, they weren't the greatest of Christians, but he still removed them, right? So there's hope for us that, that you know, aren't the Pauls and the Peters and Johns of this world. He's still going to take us, Right? So we understand that before he brings about this destruction. And, and understand, people say, well, these things have been happening, trials and tribulations. But we're talking worldwide destruction. The flood was worldwide, right? It wasn't localized. It wasn't a local flood. It was worldwide, right? And so likewise will be the tribulation time. But let me give you a, a couple of other things here. Again, a little, little research does us good. The seven-year tribulation period. By the way, did the saints of old even think they were going through a seven-year tribulation time? No. They thought the Lord was coming back, period. Right? As we look at the historians through the time, Clement, 96 A.D., Polycarp, 108 A.D., Ignatius, later on John Calvin and, uh, and Martin Luther all taught the rapture and the second, the second coming and the time of tribulation. These aren't, this isn't something new that somebody developed in 1830, folks. The time of the tribulation, since the book was written, into that first century as, as people read these things, they saw the coming tribulation. The, the, the church has believed it's coming. But it also believed that we'd be gone before that time would come. And again, it doesn't mean we can sit around and do absolutely nothing, but it, was, it does mean is that we ought to be busy doing the Lord's work. As his children, we ought to be doing what we're called to be doing. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. By the way, the 
the wrath that's poured out, the tribulation now, is, a, is an instrument of, uh, of Satan, right? Who's pouring out judgment during the seven-year tribulation? Is it Satan? No. Who is it? It's God himself, isn't it? Pouring out righteous judgment upon those nations and those people who have rejected him. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I, I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now watch. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them that what? Love his appearing. The Bible says this, there's, there's crowns that we can get. We can take those crowns, we're going to cast them at Jesus' feet. And one of those is when we believe that the Lord's coming back. And we look forward for him coming back. We love his appearance. I'm ready. Amen. I'm ready. I, I, you know, before we close in prayer, we could head up, right? right? And I hope it's head up right through that ceiling. Up we go in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Right? The dead in Christ rise first. We with are alive and remain. We caught up together to meet them in the air. And we'll always be together with the Lord. What a day that will be. I'm going to be excited. By the way, isn't that a day you ought to share with somebody else? Isn't that, you know, you have to walk up to them and say, you're a filthy, rotten, dirty, rotten sinner. You're going to hell. Why don't you go up to them and say, I'm going to tell you about the greatest day, okay, that's going to happen. Let me tell you about God's plan and what he's told us. I'm not making this up. This is what God said, okay? That Christ will appear in the clouds. Only those who put their faith and trust will see him. And the graves are going to pop open. Bodies are going to come out, up into the air. Those who are alive upon this earth, guess what? They're going up too. Now, all those that don't have a trust in Christ, they're not going. They'll stay here. All those who died in the grave, right? But we're going up. And the Bible says this, we will be forever with the Lord. No more sin, no sorrow, no death. Nothing. Home with the Lord forever. Wouldn't you like to spend eternity like that? Here's how you get there. Maybe what we ought to do is preach the rapture a little bit. Because here's what's coming. And you go over to Thessalonians and say, by the way, if, if I share the gospel with you and you reject it and the rapture comes, it'll be too late. You'll have to go through whatever part of the tribulation you'll go through. And at the end of the tribulation, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. I hope one thing, if you learn this tonight, the Lord is coming back. His return, we divide into two parts, the rapture, and then, of course, his second coming to put an end to everything upon this earth and to usher in a thousand-year millennial reign of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Amen. You ready to go? Ready to be caught up? I don't like heights, but I'll take those. All right? Be caught up in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to be together forever with the Lord. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed tonight. Get ready. Go tell some friends. Go tell some others. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming back. You might want to share with them, look, there are a lot of folks that didn't believe Jesus would come the first time, and he did, when he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. And he's promised us he's coming back. Let me ask you tonight, heads bowed, eyes closed. Are you saved tonight? Do you know? Do you know... If he appears and that trump sounds and we're caught up as Christians, are you going? Hope so. Maybe so. When this music starts, you come to an altar and you make sure of it if you're not saved tonight. For those and most of you I believe already have, listen. Maybe it's time to start getting a little serious about the end times. 
He's coming back shortly. And I will tell you this. His coming is more eminent than it was in the time of Polycarp, in the time of Ignatius, in the time of John Calvin and Martin Luther, in the time of Peter, Paul, and Mary, okay? And all those in that first church, in that first century, understand something. He's coming back. Let's get serious about telling people about Christ. Still have a box and a half of those cards. They don't do us any good sitting here, folks. But you can hand them out. I think I handed five or six or seven out, out last night. Because people say, what church do you go to? Give them a card. Give them a card. Say, I go to New Life Bible Baptist Church. By the way, you might want to watch some of those videos on the back. It might answer some questions that you have. You can go online. You can go to our website. And you can look at us and see who we are before you come. We got to do it. Maybe tonight you just need to come and pray and say, Lord, use me. Use me until you return. Father, we come before you. Pray now that you'll bless this time of invitation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's the pianist's place. You need to come and pray. Lord, use me. Use me until either you come and take me home. Or you send your angels to come and get me. Use me. Use me to reach the lost. Use me. Good time. Look, if you stay right where you are, I want you to be in prayer. Not a good time to be looking around. Good time to be heads bowed and praying. Lord, use me. We talked about worship this morning. Let me worship you. The greatest form of worship is to go out and tell others about the one that you're worshiping. We're all busy. We all things we're doing. We also all run into people throughout every day. Tell them about Christ. Take a track. My Jesus, I need thee as a song. praying here at the altar. Just keep praying. You know, I was, we had a couple come to our church once and they said, we like your church, we like your people, we like your preaching, but your invitations are too long. I didn't know what to say. I said, well, people are talking with God, it's not up to me to interrupt them, right? Right? God, could you cut it short? We need to get done here. And someday, you just ought to walk with my wife and I for just, just walk with us for a couple days and get the phone calls we get and the comments we get. You know, sometimes you wonder, is there anybody home? Right? We're glad you're here tonight. And uh, let's be busy about the Lord's work this week. You're entering your mission field uh, back here on Wednesday night as we gather together and uh, once again. So um, anything I need to announce, anything I'm missing other than a brain. All right. Lord, we come before you now. Thank you for this night. And 
Lord, I pray that tonight maybe you got a few more folks excited about your imminent return. Excited that you're coming back, and we hope you do. But also realizing that there's a job to get done before you get back here. There's souls to tell about you. There's gospel tracts to hand out. There's people to, uh, to, to introduce Christ to. And Lord, may we be busy about that before that moment comes when it will be too late. Lord, help us tonight to be strong for you, to witness to others. We pray tonight for those that are ill in our church. We think of Gloria Kaufman and Joy Hayes and uh, Brenda Raines, Jim Bryant. Uh, just uh, heal them up, Lord. And we ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Dismissed.